We're live, gentlemen. It is my tremendous honor to chair this family office virtual round table on behalf of the prestigious Harassus Extraordinary Meeting 2020. The purpose of this discussion is due to the substantial growth of family offices over the last 10 to 15 years, which has measured approximate a tenfold increase according to many studies, including a recent ENY study. We are aware that there are a diverse range of parties joining us today, and it is my pleasure from government and diplomacy, royalty, trade and promotions agencies, large corporates, project owners, entrepreneurs, SMEs, all wishing to understand the best manner of connecting with and collaborating with family offices and ultra high net worth individuals to forge long term relationships is growing but often private and some investor. There's a same family office industry. If I show you a hundred family offices, I'm literally showing you a hundred family offices, meaning no two are exactly the same. So to open your perspectives further and find a road of how selected families operate and what their thoughts are leading into the future during the, this uh, of pandemic risks, we assembled several experts with clearly diverse backgrounds, different geographic focus and views on investment criteria. The topic of the, top of the first this topic will be family officers investing in the pandemic risk. With COVID-19, there are challenging hurdles facing business owners and investment groups seeking family funding. Where are the financially uh, liquid family offices allocating their wealth during these uncertain times? What is the best asset class for these investments? And most importantly, what it's my tremendous uh, pleasure to bring in and introduce our distinguished guests. Firstly, Atua Ekase, who is managing partner of North Hill Advisory Partners out of the United Kingdom. Uh, George Kanan, who's had some technical issues, may join us shortly uh, for, this, uh, for this, this, this webinar. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Arab Bankers Association. Ian Morgan, who is Head of Transaction of iWestCore Europe in the United Kingdom, a single family office. And Asha Noor, who is Chief Investment Officer of Al Tuk Group, Saudi Arabia, a single family office. Gentlemen, it's a tremendous honor to welcome you all here. Thank you. Peter. So to kick things off, what we're going to do is, uh, is, is, is really just sort of get everyone to have a chance to understand a little bit more about each and every one of you. Um, so in approximately 60 to 90 seconds, it would be my pleasure if you could share with us a little bit about your background and how your family office was formed. Um, how did it come to be, as it were? Ian. Yeah, good, uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Did we lose Peter? Yeah, I think he's redone. Okay. That's okay. Oh, I'm here. So we've, we've got, so I'll, 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 I'll keep, a, I'll keep to a minute, just an intro. Um, so my background is in is in private equity, corporate finance, and real estate with a lot of real estate. Um, I worked in New York um, for for about six years before coming over to uh, the UK about fourteen years ago, um, and I then focused on real estate, private equity, family office investments, and uh, uh, pretty much in real estate um, and property. Um, so, um, and so how you know the background of the family office. Um, you know, our principal is out of the U.S., uh, made his money in, in property, in commercial property. And so we focus um, on commercial property. Uh, so we're long on commercial property. Um, we have some, some of our exposure is more passive and, uh, and liquid um, as a, you know, non-real estate. But the real estate that we do is, is more growth oriented versus, versus wealth preservation focused 
um, and focus on um, Western Europe. So that's a quick summary. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. and Asha, Asha, could you uh, shed a little bit of light of how you found your way into the family office world uh, from the institutional world? Sure. So thanks, Peter. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Asha Noor. I'm originally from Pakistan. Uh, uh, Asha, but hello. Early, I'm based in Riyadh. But... Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? I, I Yeah. So, okay, yeah. so as I was saying, I'm ordinarily based in Riyadh, but yes, today I'm dining in from Melbourne. Yes. Oh, fantastic. So, so for, for more than a decade now, I work as the CIO for the Altu Group, which is a single family office out of Saudi Arabia. And I've been in the country for close to two decades. So I guess I know a thing or two about Middle East. In the past, I worked for, like Peter alluded to, uh, for more institutionalized uh, uh, the, the corporate world, I work for PwC, I work for Morgan Stanley and the Saudi French Bank as well. Uh, so it was a leap of faith leaving those institutions behind and working for a single family office. But I think uh, in the grand scheme of things, the fact that I've been there with them for 11 years now, clearly evidences that I think the leap of faith worked out. Uh, my primary remit remains as a CIO for, for this uh, second generation single family office. Uh, so my primary remit is to be the chief investment officer and 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 for the past and the alternative asset classes globally uh private equity has uh, has historically been our main and increasingly we have allocated uh in the uh, sure, VC space as Russia. well um yes can you hear me can you hear me peter gentlemen okay. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I am, uh, by background, a commercial banker, uh, worked most of his life at Citibank, uh, New York and elsewhere, London. Uh, I, in 1992, that's a long time ago, I was asked by a very famous Saudi prince, Prince Khaled bin Sultan, to run his affairs. And uh, in doing so, I think I actually produced the first family office ever. Uh, we, were, uh, we had enough offices in Riyadh for administrative purposes in Geneva for portfolio management purposes, in London for managing the real estate portfolio, uh, and we, oh, across the world. And we uh, invested in every conceivable type of investment. Um, and uh, I uh, augmented the office with, with talent, with skills that are not widely used, uh, I, I find, uh, such as um, uh, quantity surveying, because most of those guys, rich guys, really build all the time and refurbish all the time. So um, uh, since then, I, I left the matter. I found the office five years later, and I left it, and uh, I pursued a, 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 a consulting career on my own, out of London, basically. I'm, I'm originally Lebanese, and I'm speaking to you right now from Lebanon. Thank you, Peter. I'll, I'll go next, um, if everybody can hear me. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, my name is Aito Khaise. I'm managing partner of uh, North Hill Advisory Partners. What we do is actually, unlike the other, my other panelists, we actually are providing corporate finance and um, general advisory support to uh, family offices. Most of our family offices are from the Middle East region. We have a few from the United Kingdom, where I'm based. Um, and our range of clients, we have a couple of multi-family offices, several uh, single-family offices as well in our portfolio. Uh, prior to setting up North Hill, I was a general partner with a private equity fund, Havenvest, which was the ex-HSBC private equity fund from the Middle East. We, had a, we conducted a buyout, and we actually managed a total of uh, $1.2 billion. Uh, prior to that, for best part of a decade, I was um, running a family office out of London for a Saudi family and responsible for the illiquid uh, portfolio, as well as managing the offices in uh, India and the GCC. Um, I think the way we look at ourselves is that we are essentially a, a, a virtual support to family offices. So we're really trying to identify and um, help execute their investment strategy. So I thank you for the opportunity.
Brilliant. And uh, look, my next question is, is, and it's a key question on the lips of many entrepreneurs, asset managers, governments, and others seeking capital and debt, is where are other financially uh, liquid family offices considering allocation of their wealth during these uncertain times? What's the decision-making process, the risk profile, the minimum maximum deal size, and the returns that you're targeting? Uh, Asha, you're muted, but I might uh, put that one to you to start with on your uh, criteria on um, where you're allocating in uncertain times. Sure. Sure. Okay. Let me take a stab at this in two stages. First, the topic of uncertainty and then our uh, decision-making process. Look, everyone is using the term uncertain times, and they certainly are. We are now past a million deaths due to COVID-19. Very sad, very unfortunate, but I would think completely avoidable. My point is that we are into our uncertain times because of our kind of emotional overreaction. Government has more than 11 on the problem which they call COVID-19. Mind you, this is a disease that has a recovery rate of 99.6%, and that is without a vaccine, which should hopefully be with us soon enough. So I would say, I would simply say that the uncertain landscape is only for those who want to believe that these are uncertain times. These are uncertain times, I guess, only for those with a, with a kind of a short-term trading mindset. For most investors like us, though, it is more of a difficult and an opportunistic time. So, And it's no less uncertain or no less opportunistic than it was 12 months ago or 24 months ago. So we as a family office, we have stayed the course and the recent turn of events have only reinforced kind of our belief that businesses who are tech savvy, who are digitally transformative, that's where the future is. If they remain nimble, uh, that's where the investment opportunity and investment thesis is. FinTech and health tech clearly are my favorites as of now. Uh, now to your question about our decision-making process. So at the family office level, we invest with a consensus at the IC level. And we will proceed with continuing to invest usually at our own preferred time, our own preferred pace, and at our own preferred times. Because honestly, there is no shortage of deal flow. There is, uh, there is no shortage of sunrises. They happen every day. So, so it's less a question of sectors and more of a question of what would fit well in our portfolio at any given point in time. On the buy side, I think we will take really? Yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There will be more chances to elaborate. And George, in your experience um, during these uncertain times, what do you feel is happening and where do you feel uh, wealthy families are allocating their money now? It could be from what you've seen institutionally with the, them transferring funds from one institution to another, or where they're direct investing. So, George, what is your view on the wealthy well, families think, that you are exposed to? I, I think the real issue is of uncertain. The, the issue of uncertainty is far graver than than, as, than um, the previous speaker uh, um, described. I think you have to add up to the layer of uncertainty in the UK, Brexit, to the, in the US, significant political uh, breakdown. Um, and and I think that calls into a question the geographical distribution of your investment. Traditionally, he uh, we, we all know that the the, the, the favorite uh, destinations for investments were markets in in the Western world. Well, the Western world is looking uh, very very uncertainty uncertain. This uncertainty, in my, to my mind, is going to is is not something that we 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 really know how to deal with. Uh, it is because it implies the movement of wealth and power from west to east, and that's continuing. And uh, the, the COVID-19 has done nothing else but to, ex to, to, to accelerate that process. Um, I think the, uh, any investment uh, approach is not driven by analysis. It's driven more by your seat of the pants. Uh, I think you've got to worry a lot about Potential inflation with all this, um, with all this um, uh, uh, packages being uh, fl floated all over the Western world. Uh, therefore, you have to you have to think of uh, of, of uh, an inflation hedge. I I, I think gold, uh, and I think everybody is into go is, is is getting into gold now. If he, if they are not in there, um, I share the fintech up thing. I'm I'm I'm, I'm head of the Arab Bank Association in London. And yes, fintech is is something 
that I have personally actually invested in on, and only recently. Uh, something very, very interesting. So uh, fintech is, is, is interesting. Thank you. Indeed. Okay. And Atua, where do you feel uh, that families are investing during times of pandemic risk? Yeah, I think um, we, we have a very different perspective because we have a range of clients in terms of, you know, our multifamily office to our single family office. So we are seeing there certainly is a, um, a, a cognizance of the uncertainty. Um, there's no question about it. So what we're actually seeing is that um, a lot of our families are being opportunistic, but at the same time being cautious. Um, and therefore, you know, there's a real emphasis on the preservation of capital. Um, the other trend that we're seeing, which is actually um, a point I think George was alluding to, is the increased liquidity in the system. So we're seeing a lot more leverage, actually, and uh, some of our families taking advantage of this excess liquidity, especially coming in from the non-traditional financial uh, institutions. So that there's, I think if I was going to characterize it, I think one of the ways in which they're trying to mitigate these uncertain times is really to ensure that there's a higher quality in terms of the counterparts that we're dealing with. So there's a real emphasis on um, performance attribution uh, and the like, and a willingness to be more in control of the capital deployment. And that's, that's something we're seeing a lot more of. In terms of sectors, we'll come on to that. I don't disagree with the sectors my fellow panelists Indeed. have mentioned. I think we'll come on to that later. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that's our next question. Yes, indeed. Well, Ian, uh, so where uh, do you feel that uh, family offices or perhaps your family office so, during these uncertain times? I think I got the gist of the question. So yeah, there are two main you, factors kind of frame investment strategy now. Um, first is there's a weight of institutional money, there's a weight of capital chasing certainty, um, what they view as certainty. And in our, in our business, it's, it's the industrial sector where institutional money kind of is chasing those deals that yield from an institutional, which is viewed as low risk. It's pushing yields way down, probably to a cyclical low. Um, you know, we're late, very late in the cycle on that on that product type, and then you've got uncertainty, which is the second thing. And, and there, you know, it's hitting retail, which you know started a couple of years ago. It's hit hotel big time starting in March. Um, you know, and leisure, you know, restaurants and that trade big time starting in March, obviously, um, and also office. No one really knows what's going on with office, um, but office is actually easier to figure out if you really put it in a lot of time, I would say. Um, but the other three are, are the, the lot of small gazing involved in what's the future of the So the pendulum of capital is swung very far away from those product types. Maybe too far, maybe independently. Uh, we'll see, there should be, it's easy to invest in hotels right now, but that might be where the value is right now. So um, yeah, we're, we're balancing uncertainty with, with, with avoiding following third mentality. And overpaying for things where our investment strategy is. Indeed, indeed. And so, what do you feel are the best uh, asset classes of investments, uh, in your opinion, given uh, this situation? Ashka? Um, so, well, I, I'm not fond of saying that it depends. But honestly, the right answer to this, because to each their own, I would think the right answer, the appropriate answer is it depends. So while I might not know what is the best asset class out there, uh, I can tell you one thing, what is not a good asset class right now. And maybe from that, we can derive a better option. So my approach right now is to stay away from the public markets. On paper, they just, they just don't make sense at all right now. Uh, 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 NASDAQ was 9,000 at the start of the year. It's, it's uh, 11,000 something now. S&P was 3,000 
200, 300. It's flat. It's 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 the same. Dow Jones is again flat. Started out at 28. It's still at 28. The Saudi stock exchange. It was at 8,000 at the start of the year. And imagine the oil crisis that we had uh, in the in the past six months. And and the Tazi, the Tadawal stock exchange is actually up. It's 8,300 now. So at least in these now these numbers, these indexes, they kind of mask the reality uh, of the pandemic, where we have had this roller coaster ride, the volatility that we have seen. Uh, so, so to me, the public markets as of now are extremely frothy, and by that and by that logic, I would think the private markets is the place to be in. Indeed, like Josh, briefly, you did mention, I believe, uh, gold uh, and fintech you were looking at, but, but what's the best asset yes, class in investments uh, in your but, opinion, but, but, given this new but I want, I want, I want to, okay, I want to agree fully with the, with the speaker. Yeah. Uh, uh, stay away from the public market. Uh, uh, there's a frenzy there, a hysterical. Um, and, um, and, and focus on opportunity. Uh, the technology, the fintech, particularly, um, there probably are opportunities everywhere. There are people in distress in a lot of places, and uh, a lot of things that can be done uh, that are uh, that you wouldn't expect. So uh, I would say keep your eyes open, uh, eyes and ears open, and um, and think of each situation by itself, and don't go into any generalized rules or or or, or uh, schemes. Just uh, stick to specific opportunities and look into them deeply. There, there are a lot of people in trouble. A lot of people need rescue. Some of those are ex excellent opportunities. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly, I think we don't. I don't think we can do that. I think what we're seeing from our yeah, I think from our perspective, what we're looking at is there's a lot of opportunistic trades out there. And I think this is a time for nimbleness um, and, and also. Sorry, Peter. Yeah. Um, what I was just saying was that really there, there appears to be a sort of dichotomy in terms of distress and also in terms of changes to the way business is done. And I think what we're finding with our clients is the ability to actually position themselves. So give you an example in distress. I think um, George referred to maybe, you know, distress debt, for example. So some of our clients are looking at that sector and are saying to themselves, if I have a long term horizon and I believe that these companies will be restructured, then it's something I'd like to look at. And Sorry, Peter. What was that? Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. So, and uh, sorry, Ian, sorry. what are your thoughts on uh, asset? Sorry, sorry. The stream was cut out. I thought you'd concluded. Keep, 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 no, no. Keep, 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 sorry. What I was just saying, very quickly to round up is that on the distress side, the only thing I would say about the advice on the public markets, I totally agree with my fellow panelists. We do have, for example, uh, one of our multi-family office clients who have a theme that there's a long-term appreciation in oil, for example. So they're looking at consolidation plays around that sector. So the point I would make is that where you have an expertise, um, we are seeing clients going in to pick up real value from the public markets. The real um, act, uh, area of activity that has spiked for us is the whole real estate. And in the UK, for example, I think to a point that Ian made this commercial going, um, you know, losing value, this idea of city center commercial being converted to residential is something, again, some of our clients are doing uh, as well. And I think the one thing I would say is that what this pandemic has done is actually also um, brought up changes to the way in which we live and we do business. And I think, again, the investable opportunities that are rising from that as well. But we'll, more on that later. So yeah. yeah, I would, I would, um, I would echo um, a lot of the, the, the essentially that framework. Essentially, you know, yeah. well, thank you very much for that. 
Yeah. And what are your views on um, uh, asset classes, Ian? Well, go right ahead, Ian. I guess I would I would broad. You hear me? I'd, I'd go a little more broad. Um, just to sort of continue what you were saying, what I told you were saying about distressed debt. I mean, we're very early in what is likely to be an NPL, you know, non-performing loan cycle. The banks aren't really doing anything. So we need to be, we need to realize where we are in this crisis. You know, we're six or so months in. It's going to be a long haul. There are going to be good businesses. You know, to George's point, there are going to be good businesses that need capital um, that will come out of this, this, uh, this crisis with the right capital. There will be others that fail. Um, and, you know, NPLs are an interesting business. But very, uh, really have to be set up to do not a lot of family offices are. Um, you need to platform and servicing. Um, but there's going to be a lot of you know, unilateral things that happen on a distressed basis. But it's a little bit early because the banks are still giving corporate credits as far as we can see for the most part. Um, you know, how much more forbearance will they give remains to be seen. But probably 2021 will be, will be, will be a lot of distress out there. I mean, unfortunately for the for the equity, um, that's the case. Um, and yeah, it's going to hit. It's going to hit the leisure sectors and the retail sector pretty hard. Um, but um, anyway, we just need to be aware. So, but we're, we're looking. And, uh, and, and Peter, we're looking. We're looking at industrial uh, and selectively at office and quarter office. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen. Now, the key thing, and we've got many people from around the world with from very, very diverse backgrounds. Some of them, this is the first time they've, they, they've got sort of an understanding about family offices uh, and who they are and what they are. And others are very, very uh, attuned to uh, what a family office is and, and how they can often uh, di uh, operate in a very different way to one another. So the, the key, key question is, if we can li limit this to one minute, please, each, is what are the best methods for businesses to approach you, catch your attention, and align their interests in order to obtain funding or a win-win? Asha? Sure. So look, uh, Peter, I think this is an amazing question. Nobody asks us this. They, all they ask us is, where do you invest? What is your ticket size? So if only I wish they, they take the time to try and understand where we come from, what we are thinking right now, and use that to go back and look at their product suite and show us the best that they have. Look, we have been investing for four decades. We have all the relationships that we care about. We are well-placed, well, -placed, well, al well allocated well positioned but of course we are nonetheless we are of course on the quest for better managers to diversify to hunt for better offerings explore new mutually beneficial relationships but i don't want the conversation to start with by saying hey i've got an amazing deal for you uh, so i think the only way someone is going to capture my attention is to actually educate me about a sector or a geography or an offering uh, 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 or a technology that is new to me and and then just patiently wait it out until I do my own due diligence at my own pace. So I'm I'm personally all for finding the next unicorn in the making. I'm 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 obviously looking for those evergreen structures uh, with a steady cash flow dynamic. But I have a duty of both capital preservation and capital uh, appreciation in my existing portfolio. So I guess uh, uh, to answer your question in one line, it is Patience is the recipe that I would suggest to anyone approaching us for the uh, for the first time because relationships need to be harvested, uh, not that fast as usually the sell side people do. Uh, family office sector treat it like they're speaking to institutions with the check check box criteria, and the relationship component, understanding your specific needs as a family office is a very, very unique situation to each party. And it's about cultivating those long-term relationships and really understanding uh, that. However, the key thing that, that, that I'm sure our speakers will att uh, attest to is the fact that uh, family office money can often be sticky money, as they say in the industry. Meaning they may take their time to make a decision, but once they do, 
they do really want to stick with you uh, if they believe in you and your company and your vision. Uh, George, the same question. I mean, uh, when people approach you or the families that you know uh, and advise, uh, what what have they got to do to capture your attentions, al align their interests uh, in order to potentially obtain investment? I, I I don't know how to answer this question, actually. I, um, we, we, you know, I get approached all the time, almost nonstop. And... Um, um, I'm not sure. I, I can't. I'm not sure exactly what catches my attention. Uh, what? Uh, maybe the maybe the fellow. Maybe the idea. Maybe an environment. Maybe something I've just read or seen or uh, a movie. I don't know. Uh, it's a difficult question to answer. And I would have thought that um, uh, it depends a bit on your mood <laughs> as, as, at the time. Uh, I can't give you a scientific response on this one. I'm sorry, please. Peter? Peter. Yeah, That's fine. Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, um, after, yes, yeah, Atua, I, so what catches yeah, your attention? I, mean, what, what I, I, think, I think the key thing is an alignment of interest. Um, uh, what I mean by that is, and the key word in your question was the whole thing of alignment, and I think that that's important. And, and the appreciation when they come to us to present, because again, we see a lot to present onto our families. And so what we're looking for is really, our client's money is participatory money. They, it's not, the days of passive investing is, is long gone. So a lot of our clients are of a sophistication that to Ash's point, they can understand the offering. And therefore they want to see a true alignment and they want to see to capture that sort of, they want to see a demonstrable edge in terms of whether it's technology or it's market, they want to see that differentiating factor. So when you approach, I think that's the thing to come to come to the table with. And, and always, also, I think that's your great advice about patients, that these things take time and therefore the automatic sort of binary yes, no, you have to work at that relationship. So that would be the thing. So we're looking at people who say, fine, take the cash in, but be looking more at an alignment for the monetization and how we both make money, both the business and the investor base. So that's what I would contribute. Tremendous. And Ian, what captures your attention? What are uh, people, what, 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 what makes a connection with a third party that uh, potentially has you uh, uh, won over or impressed that they would, you would want to potentially align your interest with them or invest? So, I mean, all the guys here have made excellent points. And the only thing I would add to it is, um, you know, we look at the other three things we'll probably look at is if someone has a real principal mentality as opposed to, you know, an agent who loves everything and sells everything. So it's a real principal focus on how we're actually going to make money on something. The second would be if something's something that's off market. Um, and, and the other would be if someone has a deep subsector expertise. That's that's kind of a competitive mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand your perspective on that, Ian, and, and that's a, a key thing, is that during this pandemic risk, what is considered high risk and a not touch uh, as, an, as, a, as an investment for some people could be a very, very attractive opportunity for another because they've got a knowledge and expertise and they're in a risk mitigation sort of position because of that knowledge, because of those relationships, because of that, that background. Uh, and, and that's often you find family offices, particularly single family offices, where a patriarch is still very active in a business where he had his liquidity event and, 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 and realised his wealth, is that they are often focused on, the, pat the patriarch will focus on that area, but then he'll have the extra team members to diversify those interests further. Um, no, very interesting point there. Um, okay, what I'll do, I'll also put this is, is how does your approach differ when looking at a direct investment or co-investment? Um, it's a good question, actually. I think what we're seeing now, there isn't that much of a difference. I think what we're seeing in our client base, to be very frank, is that it's more an alignment of, on a co-investment basis, working with sector experts. So, for example, our clients will, and there are three specific areas in the capital markets, in real estate in particular, and in, in sort of the tech sector. And um, sort of best illustrated with an example. So we have a client, for example, 
who's actually working with a UK based um, um, a manager to really focus on um, the whole area of the private rental sector. So they've selected the country, the, the city. So Manchester, Birmingham, Bristol have been hi hi highlighted. And what they've done is set the criteria for particular yield. And basically, they are the balance sheet to the management team going out and um, acquiring properties that meet that criteria. So I think, um, and then it's the, the point that um, I, I think you mentioned, Peter, is that what we're seeing clients do is focus on areas where they have a real deep expertise and saying, okay, I bring either the market, the knowledge, but I also bring the expertise with people who I co-invest alongside with. And lastly, a good example, just again, taking advantage of this uh, current situation, we have a, um, one of the family offices that's involved in the retail sector looking again at the role of, of bricks and mortar and seeing how they translate onto an online platform. So those kind of things are, are, are the kind of things that we're seeing. But what one, one feature is the fact of making sure that the expertise is, is, is there, that you've got the sector expert, whether it be the manager or the family office. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yes. And, and Ian as well. Um, this is an area that I know you look a lot at. Um, how does your uh, approach differ when considering direct investments and co-investments? If you could limit it to a minute, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. So we do everything direct. We don't do anything indirect. Um, we do almost everything we do, uh, especially over 15 million pound or, or euro lot size is, um, is a co-invest with another family office. So we do club deals on every deal. Um, so yeah, that's part of our, you know, we don't, we don't raise funds, so we don't invest on most big deals. Yeah. And I should the same sort of thing as far as a direct investment or co-investment, do, how does your approach potentially differ? If we could limit it to one minute. Sure. Um, so historically we are allocators in PE funds, the private equity funds. And from there, uh, we have been able to get into co-investments and so, Direct investments are there in our portfolio, but they are clearly outnumbered by the by the PE funds and the co-investment allocations that we have. And there's tons of benefits for us to sticking with our approach, rightly or wrongly so. Uh, so direct investment is not our go-to option. But yes, we have done a few direct investments as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what is the role technology has played, do you think, George, in uh, the way uh, investors are looking at, 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 at this uh, environment that we're in now and going into the future So, and, and, and how they would allocate? So what do you feel the role technology has played? Because I know you've gone into fintech um, uh, and you're not necessarily a long-term investor in that. So what is the role of technology in your investment decisions? Um, I think uh, it is... Um uh, safe to say that uh, without um, a technologically pr a, 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 a an investment situation that does does not have a prevalent position in technology in its own technology, I think it's not worthwhile even looking at. Uh, so technology is all is is all important, uh, and that does not necessarily mean that it is a tech company, but in its area, whatever investment I do. It's going to have to be based on the fact that the people doing the work utilize and invest in a technology that is paramount, that is at the top end of its field. I don't know whether I've answered your question, mm -hmm. but okay. uh, and, uh, we don't have the supre supremacy in technology. You are nowhere now. Okay, and, and, and a key question, and, and very, very short. Okay, can we limit this to 30 seconds each? Um, what do you feel institutions and governments need to do to back up and support entrepreneurs and early stage family office investors that take selected investments to another level in scalability and uptake? So how could governments and institutions back up you and the entrepreneurs you do business with? Let's keep it very brief to about 30 seconds. Very brief. Stay out of the way. <laughs> okay, go right ahead, George, if you'd like to. Look at I was getting to you. I'm saying you stay out of the way. But, uh, but go right ahead, George. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying uh, stay, uh, stay, uh, stay out of the end. Leave us alone. Yeah, one thing I would say is I think that there needs to be in an environment where 
people have to be more entrepreneurial. We have to have more startups. We have to have more seed investing. And I think that in a way, institutions can actually encourage that by facilitating. Sorry? I didn't hear you. Okay, and uh, Asha, uh, as well, what, what do you, Asha, what do you feel institutions and governments do to back up and support um, family offices and uh, early stage in, uh, family offices and entrepreneurs? I think the role of the government is pretty much defined and they should stick to the role of managing the fiscal policy and the monetary policy and providing the infrastructure support. So on, on, on the VC side, on the acceleration and the incubator side, I think if they can provide more tax friendly uh, regime, I think that is all that is expected or required of them and let the, let the capitalist economy decide for themselves which sectors to allocate in and where, where the money and where the interest lies. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to uh, take this into a close. So, um, and as a special uh, insight to our audience here at Harassus, in maximum 30 seconds, if you could pick one, maximum two investments or sectors in any geographic location internationally that you feel could be the most successful in the coming three to five years, what investment sector or opportunity would that be? And what's your reason for having that confidence? So one investment anywhere in the world, if you had to pick it, okay, uh, what would that be? Usher, why don't you start and we'll circulate. Okay, sure. So I'd say food tech is the next frontier in terms of making billionaires out of founders and investors. So investing in food tech is expected to probably give you the best bang for the buck right now. From food aggregators to cloud kitchens and this new craze about uh, about food being made in laboratories now, I'm referring to the, the likes of Impossible Foods, all points to where the next successful opportunity might lie. Okay. And for me, that is food tech. Food tech, brilliant. Okay, George, one investment, any sector anywhere in the world, what do you think is going to be a good opportunity in the coming three to five years? Anything to do with uh, with global warming? Yeah. Anything that ties up to food too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and a tour. Uh, for me, it's um, digital health and how we use AI in in, in a tool. health and uh, it's digital health and how we use um, artificial intelligence and telemedicine. I think that's a huge, huge growth area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Ian, uh, in, in, in 20 seconds. I would say, um, I would say uh, drone delivery and drone logistics. That's essentially a part of infrastructure that's just in its nascent stages. No one knows, um, you know, who's going to be the winner, winners in this sector. And it's kind of like, you know, the railroads getting set up. It's going to create a lot of wealth for someone who can, who can, you know, gain scale. Um, and it, it might not be, it might not be Amazon and those guys. Yeah. Well, that's exciting, ladies and gentlemen. So you've just he heard from four world-class experts uh, with all very unique different and different backgrounds and expertise have given you uh, many unique insights here. And uh, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to investigate a number of these insights uh, further that they've just given. Um, in summary, you have basically gained a very unique perspective from several world-class investors and experts from very diverse family offices. And we've gained greater insight into the challenges facing governments, business owners, investment groups seeking family office funding, where financially liquid family offices are allocating wealth during these uncertain times, the best asset classes in their opinion for investments, the best methods and approach to potentially collaborate with family offices and obtain funding, and that special one insight 
um, that, uh, th th that they've shared with you that uh, could quite frankly be a, 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 a very valuable investment to consider into the future. But again, no formal investment advice given, but just their opinions. We strongly encourage all of our distinguished audience to take action with the tremendous knowledge and insights provided today and welcome interactivity collaboration, which has made Harassus so successful over the years. Therefore, for further thoughts or questions, you are most welcome to reach out to Harassus directly, myself via email at inquiries at atosinvestments.com. That's inquiries with an E at ATOS Investments, A-E-T-O-S Investments.com, by LinkedIn at Peter J.R. Aylwin, or our website, which is presently being revamped, www.adosinvestments.com, or any of our distinguished panelists via their social media or uh, their links uh, that were in their bio. Um, this concludes our Family Office Roundtable discussion. I thank our distinguished panelists, the dedicated staff of Harassus, and particularly Harassus Chairman Frank Jürgen Richter, whose dedication and commitment has made this engaging Family Office Roundtable uh, possible. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I wish you great prosperity and safety during these uncertain times and a most exciting and enjoyable rest of the day. Thank you. And thank you to our guests. Thank you. Peter. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Great job, Peter. Yeah. Good stuff, Peter. Yeah, we just leave. Well done. Yeah. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Nice to see you sometime. Take care. Bye-bye.